Oh, you, you all were watching the clock. Amen. <laughs> it got to nine and it got quiet. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, glad to see you all here this morning. You're all looking great. And uh, we've got a packed house, it looks like, for a while. <clears throat> we're going to uh, start off this morning uh, with an invocation uh, led by Patricia Huizar uh, from the uh, Visalia Republican Women Federated. So if you could uh, stand if you'd like to and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be led by Vice Chair McCarry. Please bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we recognize you as a supreme authority Yet, you instituted government to protect, offer supportive services, and establish justice for its citizens here on earth. We thank you, God, for our current board, as well as the department heads that administer the various programs under their purview. Having relocated from a neighboring county, I experienced the benefits of sound decisions at the board level. With your providential guidance, Tulare County can be seen as a model on how to maintain services, be fiscally sound, and create positive growth. While our leaders strive to govern properly, there remain challenges such as homelessness and substance abuse. They strive to address these challenges in humane and caring actions. Therefore, we ask humbly for wisdom for this board to overcome these. We appreciate, Lord, the cooperation between the board, our sheriff, and city council. With your help, Father, our citizens will step up and become more involved in local government to make Tulare County an even better place to live, work, and raise our families. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me saluting our flag. Ready? Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, thank you, uh, Vice Chair McCarry for opening us up there. And actually, I'm going to call on you again to start off our Board of Supervisors matters this morning. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see such a packed house. Um, it's an exciting day today. I've got some proclamations to do. I, I want to thank the, uh, the Visaya and the uh, Tipton Queens in attendance for showing up today. I know it takes a lot of work and time from you and, and to get in your, in your festa gowns, so thank you very much. Uh, this last week was uh, another busy week. Uh, I just had a LAFCO meeting that we attended. I think that was a, almost a record, huh? 18 minutes or something right, on that one. Right. Yeah, that one turned out pretty good. Uh, we also attended the Visaya Chamber Annual Awards. I, I had to leave early for another event, but I want to congratulate all the awardees that were there and, and received. I know Salt and Light was the one that I saw, and uh, that's, that's exciting news, and uh, they've done a lot of hard work, and they're well-deserving of it. From there, I left and I went to Summer Night Lights in Poplar, and uh, it was at the school there. I haven't been able to make all those events, but uh, the, the few that I've made have been just fantastic. A nice, safe place. It's great to see families together out there attending uh, these events and parents with their children. And they actually had a little tent station where uh, parents could go inside of the tent, and each tent was a book where they were to read with their children. And actually, uh, so that was nice forming a bond with them, and, and uh, it was great, and, you know, I got to see just everyone going, and, and the stray dogs were just laying around out there like they're part of the family, and, and nobody bothered them. It was great. I really enjoyed it. had a good time. Uh, Friday, I attended the ribbon-cutting ceremony for the uh, museum, Exeter Museum. Uh, they've done rebranded it. They actually did an entirely different uh, look, and uh, they're doing tours. They plan on actually... Uh, upgrading it every so many months so they can talk about the, the history of Exeter. They also had Saturday morning was the AIDS walk in Visalia. I, I attended that just in the opening because I had another event to be at, but uh, it was, that was very well received and turned out. It uh, looked like a really great event uh, as it continued. From there, I went to, back to Poplar where I, they had uh, Day of Self-Determination. 
So there's a strong Philippine community in, in Poplar, and uh, they were celebrating the Philippine Re Revolution of 1896, and uh, they brought in traditional and cultural dancers, and it was another just wonderful event. And last night was a Toolville community meeting. I got a phone call yesterday afternoon. They were having a meeting regarding their water and some other concerns they had, so they asked me to attend, and I attended that. And that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Vice Chair. And we'll go to Supervisor Valero. All right. Well, good morning, Tulare County. So last week, our Forest Health Task Force meeting was very informative. This is a time in which organizations, fire safe councils, and the county can work together to remedy challenges from, for our eastern part of the county. So again, thank you all to those involved uh, and for our meeting last week. Also, the county team, along with the City of Woodlake and Congressman Costa's office, have been meeting regularly uh, to identify an Antelope Valley water project upstream near the City of Woodlake. I'm thankful to our county staff who have attended these meetings and our collaborative efforts with the City of Woodlake. Uh, last week, I also attended the Learn for Life graduation at the Visalia Convention Center. It is always great to listen to student speakers, especially those that have mustered through the hangups, the heartaches, and the headaches in order to obtain their diplomas. Uh, there was a mother there with two children and just trying to get her, her high school diploma, and so she was one of the keynote speakers there. Um, on Thursday, I briefly attended the Visalia Chamber Awards as well and then made my way to speak at the Nuevo Comienzo graduation ceremony in Orosi, and then attended the Leadership Northern Tulare County graduation ceremony. Uh, also attended a Summer Night Lights program event. This one was uh, provided by the Family Services of Tulare County uh, in Goshen, and it was titled Game Day. And so it was great to see so many kids participating and doing positive stuff in our community. I appreciate the Summer Night Lights program for making a positive difference in our communities so that students are engaged and active. Um, on Saturday, I gave the invocation at the golf tournament for changing minds one at a time. Uh, this nonprofit works with our students on the margins, um, just in terms of um, building bicycles, as well as doing um, auto mechanic work. And so changing minds is definitely doing the great work there. Um, yesterday, I traveled to UC Merced, where I met with the Vice Chancellor. He provided a tour of the university and showed me the 2020 Project, a series of academic and residential buildings built recently as add-ons to the ever-growing campus. I also got to meet with the Director of Financial Aid, the Director of Admissions, and the Director of Marketing as we discussed ways in which to increase South Valley San Joaquin students to UC Merced. Uh, this week, I have a Badger Town Hall tomorrow, a Dinuba Chamber uh, Government Affairs Committee meeting this week, a National Parks and Mineral King Association meeting, constituent meetings in Three Rivers, participating in the community open house through Self-Help Enterprise for a project in District 4, attending the Spark Tank competition at Fresno Pacific University on Thursday, and then the United Way Power of the Purse on Friday, um, I will also be traveling to Los Angeles to speak at the 10-year anniversary, uh, anniversary of the Water Education for Latino Leaders program, and then a Three Rivers Historical Museum event on Saturday. And that is all I have, Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Valero. Supervisor Sheckley in. Good, Good morning. morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, too, attended the um, Chamber Awards, and I stayed through all the awards. So, again, congratulations to Salt and Light as nonprofit of the year. This is a nonprofit that started just four years ago and has done amazing things in our community to help those who are experiencing homelessness. I also want to recognize the small business of the year, which is Topograph, the medium business of the year, Quad Knopf, and the large business of the year, California Water Services. Um, Sarah Ashuri and Marty Zeeb were man and woman of the year, so congratulations to them. Uh, Saturday morning, I attended the AIDS walk at Valley uh, Strong Stadium, and then that night attended the Tulare County Beef Boosters uh, dinner. This is an organization that started about 17 years ago to help kids uh, who are raising uh, beef for 4-H or FFA or to get kids interested, and in that time, they've raised over a million dollars to help uh, kids throughout Tulare County do that, so it's pretty amazing. There were some scholarship awardees there, folks going to Texas Tech, Princeton, uh, and a lot of pretty awesome colleges, and Fresno State. So 
Um, this Thursday, I have my uh, Valley Air Board meeting in Fresno. I'll be returning and attending a ribbon cutting at Family Services. Um, and then Thursday night, I will be attending um, a meeting and dinner with folks from the San Francisco SPCA who have been very uh, involved in our animal services um, and think they're doing an amazing job here in Tulare County and are trying to do all they can to, to help them out. And on, we're in dark next week uh, in honor and, and recognition of Juneteenth. Um, but next Friday, I will be speaking on a panel with Mayor Martha Flores, uh, Women in Transportation. So that's it. All right. Thank you, Supervisor Shecklin. Supervisor Vanderpool. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a few items that I wanted to uh, go over this morning. Uh, yesterday, we had a meeting of the uh, Greater Cuya Groundwater Sustainability Agency. Uh, I'm sure everyone's aware that uh, groundwater regulation is you know, taking place right now, and it's really hitting the ground in full force. And um, uh, one of the interesting uh, items that we discussed yesterday is, uh, is the Land Flex program in the Greater Cahuilla. And that is actually a, it's intended from the state to be a land retirement program. Uh, and out of the three uh, pilot GSAs in the state, Greater Cahuilla has the largest number of landowners who have signed up to retire ground uh, in its jurisdiction. Over 3,000 acres have signed up in that program, um, and that's uh, basically a value of uh, six to eight million dollars. So uh, pretty significant, uh, uh, and th those acres are not going to be uh, overdrafting this uh, groundwater basin, and they're not going to be uh, uh, taking water in the future. And so it's a, it's a very interesting pilot program, but uh, uh, those are the types of things we're going to be seeing as this uh, groundwater uh, regulation and uh, these plans go forward. Um, today I have a space planning ad hoc committee meeting at uh, 1.30 at the General Services Office. Uh, I have a retirement board meeting, and that's a public meeting tomorrow at uh, 8.30 a.m. at the Tessera Board <coughs> Chambers. On Friday, I have the United Way Power of the Purse event at 7 o'clock at the Convention Center. Last year I was arrested for stealing a purse. Um, uh, this year, I don't know what we're going to do, uh, uh, but it's always an adventure and a lot of fun. And, uh, uh, they do a great job raising money, and uh, I really appreciate all the organizations that come together to support the United Way. Um, then on uh, Friday, I'm not able to attend this event due to a family commitment, but uh, uh, they have a Tulare Salute to Dairy in, uh, event at the International Agri Center. That's at 6 o'clock. I want to congratulate the Mancebo family. They are the 2022 our 2023 Dairy Family of the Year. And I also want to congratulate the 2022 Dairy Princesses, uh, Madison Andrade and Helche de Young. Um, great job, it's a year-long commitment and I uh, appreciate uh, all that they do to help educate and spread awareness about the dairy industry uh, and agriculture as well. Next week we are uh, not having a board meeting due to the Juneteenth holiday and I want to uh, also acknowledge the public meetings that are taking place next week. Uh, we have a first five commission meeting that's taking place on the 22nd at 10 a.m. right here. And uh, then a, a very significant event in Tulare uh, is happening on the 26th. Uh, that's at 9 a.m. The International Agri Center Way groundbreaking will be taking place. That interchange was a huge, huge gain and a huge fight uh, that was fought to uh, make that happen. But that is a true public-private partnership. Uh, it's a collaboration from state, federal government, uh, and also local businesses, local landowners. Uh, that's going to be transformational uh, for the southern end of the city of Tulare. Uh, so exciting to see that project move forward and see everyone come together uh, to make that possible. But again, it wouldn't be possible if it weren't for Measure R. So I uh, want to really uh, uh, give kudos to uh, Measure R and Tulare County taxpayers for uh, voting that into uh, existence in 2006 or seven. Um, and then uh, lastly, there will be a meeting of the Tulare County Association of Governments on the 26th later on that day. Uh, a lot to celebrate and look forward to it. That's all I got, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you, Supervisor Vanderpool. Uh, a few things I'll uh, report on. Uh, last Wednesday, I uh, went over to the city of Porterville to the uh, council chambers and recorded a, a video clip for CSET. Um, and so after they do some uh, massive editing and overdubs, I'm looking uh, forward to seeing the results of that. And then uh, after that, uh, we had our uh, meeting as uh, Vice Chair uh, Macari had mentioned of, uh, of LAFCO. Uh, and then uh, Friday had a, uh, 
uh, the opportunity to go up and meet with our uh, general services agency director, Brooke Sisk, and our deputy director, Kyle Taylor, and parks manager, Albert uh, uh, Sendejas, and we looked at uh, Bartlett Park and kind of the, it serves as the uh, Corps of Engineers as the overflow area when, it, when the water goes over the spillway at uh, Success Lake. And so uh, with these latest, with this last flood, uh, we had a lot of damage at Bartlett Park. So we walked around and took a look at uh, what we would be able to do. The one good thing about it is we hadn't already done all the upgrades that we were planning on doing uh, this year before that happened. So um, at least the things that got destroyed were old things <laughs> that we're going to replace with new things. But lots of work to be done, and I appreciate uh, Brooke and Kyle and Albert uh, taking me around and uh, show, showing me the park. Uh, yesterday, I had a Habitat for Humanity Building Hope in Porterville uh, meeting. We're planning on um, building a triplex in Porterville on some donated land. Uh, my architectural office will be uh, donating those uh, architectural services uh, for those plans, and we'll, we will be hiring an intern uh, from Harmony Magnet Academy to come in and to uh, learn the ropes by uh, designing uh, that triplex. Uh, uh, and later on today, as uh, Supervisor Vanderpool mentioned, I'll be serving on the Space Planning Ad Hoc Committee over at General Services Agency. Uh, Wednesday, I have a meeting at Valley Adult Day Services over in Porterville. Uh, they've gone through some changes over there, and uh, I just, I'm just i going to go and meet with the leadership and talk about uh, what we might be able to do to help. That's a great service that they provide over there for our uh, elderly. Uh, then also uh, Wednesday evening, it's Flag, flag Day, and uh, Porterville has had a 42-year tradition of uh, retiring a huge flag at the old, it used to be Smith's, now it's Grocery Outlet uh, parking lot, and uh, so they will retire that flag and put up another, and our Sheriff Mike Boudreau will be giving the keynote address uh, Wednesday evening. Uh, Thursday, I have a uh, check-in with our Health and Human Services. Uh, uh, that we have just about monthly just to uh, touch base with where we are and really appreciate the work that uh, all that section right there is doing. You guys, they, have their, they have their kind of designated section that they sit in every time, so thank you, HHSA. And, uh, and then uh, I mentioned my, my uh, architectural company, but uh, I am, have been stepping out of the leadership, brought on a partner. We've changed the name this year to Centerline Design and Engineering, and we'll be having a ribbon cutting there to uh, celebrate that on Thursday with the Porterville Chamber of Commerce, and then I will have my Eastern Thule Groundwater Sustainability Agency meeting, and then later that night, that's a busy day, later that night is the Rotary, uh, we call it the demotion party when the president goes out, and so uh, our president, Dr. Claudia Habib from Portable College will be um, moving on, and uh, John Lawless will be coming on as the president of our Rotary Club. And it's been uh, mentioned Friday, we will be attending the Salute to Ag out at the International Agri Center in the Dairy Princess. Um, and then uh, the following week at the 99 groundbreaking that Supervisor Vanderpool mentioned, that's something that uh, this board has been advocating for for a long, long time, uh, along with our uh, San Joaquin Valley Regional Policy Council has been advocating for that for a long time. So to see that get, getting started is, uh, is very exciting. And then afterwards that day, we'll have our Tulare County Association of Governments, Tulare County Transit Authority, uh, meeting. And that is what I have to report today. That was a long list because we are not going to be uh, having a meeting next week in honor of Juneteenth. And uh, next, item number two, we are going to recognize Ann Bernardo upon her retirement from the Public Law Library and for her many years of service with Tulare County. And to make this presentation, I'm going to turn this over uh, to our supervisor who sits on that particular committee, as Supervisor Valero. All right, well, if I can have Ann Bernardo please step forward, as well as Judge Tripp, our president of the commission, the Public Law Library Commission, and any others from the commission who would like to step up as well are welcome to do so. All right, so today's recognition um, it goes to Ann Bernardo. Uh, it is always a blessing to get to do this for our employees who have given their time, talent, and commitment to the county of Tulare. I want to congratulate Anne Bernardo on her upcoming retirement. Anne has been instrumental in keeping our public law library active, engaged, and open for public use. She is a fierce advocate for our public law libraries, always keeping us up to date on Sacramento happenings and policies impacting our libraries, always passionate with her work, 
always dedicated to making sure our budget was fiscally sound and healthy, always dotting her I's and crossing her T's, and I'm going to miss Anne's great work, her can-do attitude, and willingness to lead during challenging times. And I want to just um, open the mic to allow uh, Judge Tripp if you'd like to say something, and then we can then have Anne also share a few remarks before we go to the well and take a picture. All right. Um, I was, I've been on the president of the board last year or so, and uh, what Anne represents to our county is someone who is a professional, who's committed to her job and her work, and um, I grew up here, and I really love this county. I love being here. Uh, the weather doesn't bother me. The fog doesn't bother me. I think this is a great place to live, and Anne represents that in every single way. She uh, doesn't look for any fanfare or credit. I mean, the law library runs, and, and we appreciate it. And uh, she, just every day at these meetings, just make uh, our board, uh, makes our job easier. So we... We rely upon her. She's trustworthy. She's committed. And uh, um, it's rare to find that in this world, but we find it here every day in this county. And so any employee that's worked in this county for 28 years or 20 plus years, we should always commend them. And that's why I wanted to be here today to address her, because I think she deserves every ounce of our respect and our um, just I wish her good luck and we'll miss her. And uh, and hopefully she has a great retirement and 29 years of dedicated service. I uh, cut my teeth in public service decades ago, starting with uh, Mario Obledo's office in Sacramento. And uh, over the years, I've come through nonprofits and joined the county after uh, my service as the Tulare County Symphony General Manager. So all those skills I learned over those years brought me to a really wholesome place to, to give you uh, what I learned and the growth that I've uh, had over these years. So I'm really grateful to the board and the supervisors, my trustees and my past trustees who've uh, had that faith and trust in me to keep our doors open and uh, just the agreement that fair and equal access to legal information is very important. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we'll, we'll present um, Anne with this plaque, um, and it has the county seal. Um, and so presented to Anne R. Bernardo, Law Library Director, in appreciation of your years of service and dedication to the community and Tulare County at large. All right. Congratulations. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Supervisor Blair, for making that presentation. And next we will go to another presentation, a proclamation recognizing June 2023 as Portuguese Heritage Month in Tulare County. And for this one, I will turn it over to Vice Chair Macari. Oh, you want to? Okay.
So today we have the, uh, the queens in attendance from the uh, Tipton and the uh, Visaya Halls. They, they have a festa every June. Uh, the Portuguese culture has a, a celebrating Queen Isabella, and we'll, we'll hear a little bit about the story. Uh, we have Dennis Borges here. He's actually, Denise is, uh, he's been a teacher. Uh, he's still a teacher. He's at Fresno State, and he's actually doing a lot of archiving of the of Portuguese culture in, in here in Tulare County. So I'll read this, and I'll allow him an opportunity to speak. Uh, recognizing June 2023 as Portuguese National Heritage Month in Tulare County, whereas the first Portuguese settlers came to California from the Azores Islands in the North Atlantic Ocean early in the 19th century, and today approximately 350,000 Portuguese Americans live in California, most of whom immigrated from the Azores and over 1.5 million Portuguese Americans nationwide, making the United States of America the proud home of one of the largest Portuguese disporters in the world. And whereas, since the 1860s, the Portuguese community has made indelible contributions in the Central Valley in the areas of agriculture, technology, the arts, entrepreneurship, integration, and the, their commitment to the American dream, having the only honorary consulate of Portugal in the San Joaquin Valley in the city of Tulare, and whereas the embodiment of Portuguese National Heritage Month in Tulare County celebrates a unique community rooted in their perseverance, pride, and deep f familiar ties, and a commitment to tradition, hard work, and to building bridges with other communities in the Azores, such as the establishment of the Tulare Angra do Hismo Sister City Foundation, the oldest sister city program of any U.S. city within, with Portugal, and whereas the Portuguese Holy Spirit Festas and other cultural fe festivals are an integral part of the communities in which they are held, drawing in individuals from the various ethnicities that compose our country to celebrate Portuguese heritage as they strive to keep individual traditions, language, and culture alive. And whereas in March of 2018, California's of Portuguese ancestry created the only strategic plan in the United States to teach the Portuguese language and culture in California public and private schools colleges and universities to contribute to the rich linguistic and cultural diversity of the state and foster a connection between California and Portuguese speaking countries throughout the world. Tulare High Schools hold the distinction of having one of the largest Portuguese language programs in the state of California. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Tulare County Board of Supervisors does hereby recognize the month of June 2023 as Portuguese National Heritage Month in Tulare County. It's dated June 13th, 2023. Signed by myself, Larry McCarry, uh, Supervisor Pete Vanderpool, Supervisor Amy Shucklin, Supervisor Eddie Valero, and Chairman Dennis Townsend. And I'd like to say that a lot of these uh, achievements and co accomplishments here were done by none other than Denise Borges. He's the one that's brought it up here in Tulare County and really brought us forward, so thank you. There you go. Good morning, bon dia, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you all very, very much for uh, this proclamation. It means a lot to us. Um, the Portuguese have been around for a while, but we're kind of silent in a lot of ways. Um, thanks to the board for all their work. Thanks for the recognition. Uh, the community is probably one of the most vital in uh, the state of California, and certainly in the San Joaquin Valley, thanks to the efforts of a lot of these folks from these committees who put on these festivals uh, who ha that have a lot of meaning because it came from a Portuguese queen. Portugal was a monarchy for uh, a great many years. We've only been a republic for 100 years. We're almost a 900-year-old country, so we're pretty old. Um, and uh, the uh, Queen Isabella in the 1200s, the end of the 1200s, decided that it was time that the crown did something for the people that were less fortunate. And the idea was uh, she took the poorest person in or there were quite a few of them at the time, but uh, one of the poorest uh, in the uh, monarchy in the kingdom and crowned him or her, uh, mostly him, unfortunately, at that time, um, and uh, king for the day and convinced her husband, who shares the same name as I, Dennis, uh, who uh, to give up his crown for a day to the poorest person. And the, the idea was to feed everyone with a dinner, with a meal, uh, that at least once a year, everybody in that kingdom 
and this was huge for 1290. Um, and she also set up the, what we would call today social services, the first misericordias, which was ran by the monarchy to help those who were, who were less fortunate. So she was uh, quite a, uh, an astonishing uh, lady, and it's uh, wonderful that uh, we have young Portuguese Americans now of third, fourth, and even some of fifth generation, um, multicultural, many of them from different ethnicities, not just Portuguese, that carry on this tradition. So thanks to them for all of their hard work, and thanks to the uh, board for this uh, awesome proclamation. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it on behalf of the community. Stand up here and then there. Come on down here. Head on in. Bongs, you want to come up? You've done a lot of work in this too. No? Okay. The headaches, Chris. Yes. Well, you look amazing, but I get it. Like, Everybody got their photos? Okay, I think we're good. That looks fantastic. There's a lot of work to do here. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. Looks like Thanks again. Out. You guys appreciate you coming out. That was a lot of coordination to get that group here <laughs> this morning. But I, I did tell Vice Chair McCarry that uh, he was supposed to bring food because it was a festa. Oh, we we're supposed to have some food. Yes. So. Sunday. He kind of let us down today, so next time. I, I was just informed that we're all invited to the uh, PPAV festa this weekend. So uh, Sunday there'll be sopas and uh, it's very good. Without a towel. Oh, darn. Uh. Well, we won't miss Amy, but we'll have a good time. <laughs> All right, well, that was great. And we have another uh, presentation, proclamation, um, cultural again, and that is great. Uh, as I mentioned, we're not meeting uh, next week in honor uh, of Juneteenth. And so um, uh, so the, the county, we, we, d we did declare, I think it was last year or year before, declared that that would be a county holiday as well. And so we're keeping up that uh, tradition and recognizing Juneteenth. And uh, this morning we have uh, Larry Dodson, the director of New Life Ministries of Tulare County, and he's got a whole contingent. So come on up, Larry, uh, up to the uh, microphone there. And I'm going to have him share just a little bit um, about Juneteenth. Oh, is everybody getting shy? Come on up. Yeah. <laughs> he said you were all going to join him, so it's okay. We're going to We're going to have Larry speak and anybody else who'd like to and then we will all read the proclamation and then we'll have some pictures up here in the well also. I talk to you but they're going to face you. Yeah, you can go ahead and face us and pull that microphone up cuz uh, one or two of the supervisors up here are kind of hard of hearing. Well, you know, I'm not going to mention any names. I'm actually, I'm actually being introduced as an alias because uh, Larry Dodson happens to be a pastor, pastor to Larry County for 40 years. 
I uh, am director of New Life Ministries of Tulare County. The name is not us emulating the county. We're not trying to compete or identify with you as your positions of the county, because the county has money and we have none. <laughs> uh, but the thing of serving African Americans uh, in Tulare County, they're spread out sparsely in some areas. So we wanted to make sure that every African American in Tulare County knew that they were welcome to participate with our nonprofit and also advance some of the issues such as mental health. I'm standing here with my wife this morning. My mother told me to tell you that she's my sister. <laughs> she always does. And the other people here are members of our administrative staff and volunteers because anything that we've done and accomplished, trust me, and anybody that's worked hard with people know, you can't do it by yourself. And so these people are representing other people as well that take all the congratulatory uh, accolades that are in order for doing this the third year in a row. It's a major goal of accomplishment because it became a federal law. Uh, it also became a target of mental health issues that we were concerned about with African Americans. Some of the things we put on is one is such now at Del Lago Park in Tulare this Saturday. It is the Juneteenth celebration. The purpose of those kind of activities is for us to develop social engagement uh, to, uh, to object to also try to uh, rise at community, I could get that word at first, connectedness. I know I'm going to say it well. <laughs> community connectedness. And that's something that in Tulare County, African Americans aspire because we can cook, we can dance, we can preach and pray. So we got the spirit. So we just need to develop more of the services and unities and identify things in our community that we need to improve on. I give honor to my supervisor, <coughs> Supervisor Pete. I, I started to say his last name, but we, we kind of know each other, you know? <laughs> and uh, I am so honored to be here in front of all of you because the things that we do, we couldn't have done it without the help of the county. The county has been very supportive in the mental health department. And we've had great successes, and we look forward to even getting greater successes. One thing about us, you can tell, I have the, one of the most diverse racial uh, churches in Tulare County. I'm proud of that, because rac racial reconciliation is something that's automatic for Christians. It's easy for us to not be racist and be prejudiced. But some people struggle with those things. We have so much love, we challenge anybody. Once you come around us, you'll never be the same. Hope that doesn't come across bad. <laughs> but uh, he asked me to speak, and I told him at first I didn't want to speak because you never let a preacher speak. <laughs> but the first thing I thought when I got up here and I turned around, I said, we need an offering. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Where's the offering going to go to? <laughs> That's right. All right. I, 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 did, I did say, he said, oh, don't give a preacher a chance to speak. I said, well, I mean, 10, 20 minutes, you know, kind of. <laughs> he said that was pushing it. But uh, thank you so much. Thank you all uh, for coming today. And uh, after, after I read the proclamation, I'll have you all come back up here and we'll, uh, and we'll take a picture with everybody as well. Okay. So this is uh, County of Tulare Board of Supervisors Proclamation recognizing Juneteenth in Tulare County. Whereas on January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, setting in motion the end of slavery in the United States. And whereas on June 19th, 1865, over two years after President Lincoln declared all enslaved persons free, the Union Army led by Major General Gordon Granger arrived in uh, Galveston, Texas to formally announce the end of slavery and to enforce the Emancipation Proclamation, effectively freeing the last enslaved black Americans in Texas. And whereas in 1866, freed from bondage, black Americans celebrated their long overdue emancipation on June 19th, the first celebration of Jubilee Day, later known as Juneteenth, featured music, ethnic cuisines, prayer services, and other activities. And whereas on June 17, 2021, Juneteenth was signed into law and declared a federal holiday in the United States, Juneteenth is recognized as a holiday in all 50 
U.S. states and Washington, D.C., with Texas being the first to declare Juneteenth a state holiday in 1980. And whereas on Juneteenth, we remember our extraordinary capacity to heal, to hope, and to emerge from our worst moments as a stronger, freer, and more just nation, while celebrating the power and resilience of black Americans who have endured generations of oppression in the ongoing journey towards equal justice, equal dignity, equal rights, and equal opportunity in America. And whereas Tulare County recognizes Juneteenth as an important milestone in our long march towards equality, a reminder of the great contributions African Americans have made as free citizens of our nation, as well as the injustices they suffered as slaves and the courage of our forebears of all races and creeds who gave their lives to fight against slavery. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Tulare County Board of Supervisors does hereby recognize Monday, June 19th, 2023, as Juneteenth Freedom Day in Tulare County. And it's signed by Vice Chair Larry McCarry, Supervisor Pete Vanderpool, Supervisor Amy Shecklian, Supervisor Eddie Valero, and myself, Chairman Dennis Townsend. Thank you for coming. Congratulations for accepting the proclamation this morning. Larry, that's another one that talked about uh, food. This proclamation talked about food, but we didn't see any, so. <laughs> Next time. Next time. Next time, food for Portuguese heritage. Next time, food for uh, Juneteenth, right? <laughs> okay, and that will move us down to uh, item number five, uh, public comments. At this time, members of the public can comment on any item not appearing on the agenda. Under state law, matters presented under this item cannot be discussed or acted upon by the board at this time. For items appearing on the agenda, the public is invited to make comments when the item comes up for board consideration, and any person addressing the board will be limited to a maximum of three minutes so that everyone will have the opportunity to speak. And uh, if you do come up to speak, if you just introduce yourself into the microphone. And Madam Clerk, do we have anyone signed up? Yes, Craig Peterson. Craig Peterson, that's a familiar sounding name. I don't know. Seems like he might have been west of here a little bit. Yeah. Either one's fine. Well, good morning, Supervisors. Craig Peterson, Lemoore, California, a has-been in the uh, supervisor world. Um, what a great morning. Uh, your coach, cultural diversity shined this morning. Um, I think that's what drives us to sit in those chairs. And, and uh, it was always amazing to come here to Tulare County, um, serving on the uh, KTAAA board with uh, a number of you and, and uh, doing the work of our seniors. We shared that responsibility. <clears throat> Today, I'm here to announce that uh, I've joined uh, DRC Emergency Services. It is a disaster uh, company that, that when disaster strikes your community, 
um, we step in and, and try and help. I know in previous opportunities to bid for um, the right to uh, work in Tulare County, we haven't been successful. Um, some of that is, is based on pre and post contracting. It's difficult to, uh, to always bid correctly in a post contract scenario. Um, <clears throat> My first exposure, uh, I was over in Mono County last week uh, with, uh, with uh, the supervisors there. They did uh, sign a, a pre-event contract. And, and, you know, just thinking about that, and you all know, I, I hope you all know Jeff Snow, who represents the company and who I've joined. We also uh, have Christy Coughlin, who has joined uh, DRC in uh, Northern California as well. But... Um, Thinking about, you know, for me, um, this, this opportunity uh, to pre-plan for the worst that can happen to our communities. And, and for me, I was like, Jeff, he had talked to me and is like, you know, you guys really should think about this. And I'm like, you know, Jeff, you know, the Central Valley, we just don't have those kind of events. And then, you know, we get the rain from hell for the last uh, six months and, and it affects our community. So. I, I think it's, it's really important, whether you use DRC or anyone else, um, uh, this pre-planning for the worst case scenarios in our communities and being able to respond quickly. And that's, uh, you know, what DRC uh, commits to is, is being here within 36 hours and, and uh, providing all the documentation. And, and prior to that, just making sure that, that your community is, is uh, pre-FEMA uh, registered and, and all the statistics that are required so that from the moment the disaster uh, begins, you're prepared and, and there's no lag in the services that are provided to your community. So with that, I thank you. Uh, I've had a number of uh, years of experience with one member up here, and I don't know why she doesn't have gray hair. I, why, I, why did I get the gray hair, Michelle? You had it in high school. <laughs> <laughs> To mention, Mr. Borges was here earlier. I went to elementary school. I graduated high school with Mr. Peterson. I don't know who's next. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you very much and look forward to uh, seeing you guys all again around the CSAC events. Thank you. Thanks, Craig. All right. Do we have others that are signed up? I have no other public comment cards. Okay. There's no other cards. Is there anyone else that uh, would like to address the board on items that are not appearing on the agenda? Okay, I don't see any, so we will move on. <clears throat> We're going to go on to the uh, consent calendar. And on the consent calendar, we have a, uh, a verbal correction on item number 24. If uh, Madam Council could read that. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. For item number 24 on page 2, item number 4 under the agenda item summary, it should state, that there will be an increase to the education allowance by $500 annually. The tentative agreement and the MOU attached reflect the correct amounts. Thank you, Madam Council. And then uh, also see that uh, Vice Chair McCarry has a, has a recusal. Yes, uh, I would request that item 16 be pulled for separate consideration and I have a, a, a statement to make regarding item 16. It has been brought to my attention that within the last, that within the 12 months prior to the time this matter was submitted to the board for a decision, I received campaign contributions of more than $250 from a party or agents of a party with respects to today's, to today's agenda item number 16 which is a request to enter into a release agreement for a communication site with Gill Family Ranches Incorporated. For that reason, under Government Code Section 84308, I must recuse myself from making, participating in making, voting on, or in any way using my position as a su supervisor to influence a decision regarding this agenda item. Therefore, I am excusing myself from this part of the board meeting and will not, excuse, will not discuss or take part in a government decision with respect to the matter. The clerk has requested to make this announcement part of the official public record of today's meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, are there any other items that need to be uh, pulled for separate consideration or comment by the board? Don't see any. Anyone in the crowd need to pull one for separate consideration? Don't have any? Then let's go ahead and take the balance uh, absent item number 16 on the consent calendar. I'll look for a motion. 
Moved by Supervisor Sheckley and seconded by Supervisor Valero. Cast your votes. And the consent calendar less item 16 are approved unanimously. And then we'll take item 16 and have Vice Chair McCurry step out. And by the way, just for everybody else's edification, this is the, the, the new bill that just passed uh, where campaign contributions of $250 or more, one year before, one year after, we have to recuse ourselves if we uh, receive that. So it's a new thing. So you'll probably be seeing quite a bit more of this. Mr. Chair, I'd move for approval of item 16. We have a motion by Supervisor Vanderpool, second by Supervisor Shecklian, and we can cast our votes. And the item is, is approved uh, four uh, to nothing with one at, with uh, Supervisor, Vice Chair McCarry abstaining. Somebody can go pull him back in. Are they out there? There he is, okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, correction for the record, that should be with Supervisor McCarry absent. What did I say? Abstain, it, it was on ah. the chart. So one of those ab words, absent, abstain. <laughs> Hey, if we're going to do this a lot, we're going to have to put that on our board, huh? <laughs> All right, welcome back, uh, Vice Chair McCurry. And we will move on now to our uh, 9.30 a.m. timed item, item number six. This is a uh, public hearing, and before we have the public hearing, we're going to ask uh, the clerk to provide instructions to the members of the public on our procedures. To members of the public, if you wish to provide public testimony in person, please complete and submit a comment card, provide your name and agenda item number six. Please clearly state your name for the record. Your statements will go out on the live audio stream and will be included in the audio recording of the meeting. The timer will be set to three minutes, so please adhere to the time limit. If you choose not to participate in person, you may also participate by submitting an email as this item is being heard. Email should include the sender's name for the record. Email should include the following of the subject, agenda item number six, and sent to the clerk of the board's email address at clerkoftheboard at tulerycounty.ca.gov. Public testimony will not be read, but will be made part of the record if received before the close of public testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And with that, we will take up agenda item number six, a public hearing to consider requests from the Health and Human Services Agency for the application of REACH Air Medical Services to provide air ambulance services in Tulare County. And we have Karen Elliott to make the presentation. Thank you, Good Chair. morning. Good morning. Good morning, board, Dr. Britt, Ms. Flores, Ms. Benton. I am Karen Elliott. I am the public health director. I am here this morning um, to request approval on an application and agreement for REACH Air Medical Services to provide emergency medical services for Tulare County. Tulare County has an agreement with CCMSA, known as Central California Emergency Services Agency, to administer the emergency response agreements for our county. In early February 2023, um, CCMSA reached out to Public Health to inform us that REACH Air Medical Services was interested in establishing an air ambulance contract with Tulare County. If approved, this will be a second air ambulance service for Tulare County. In March 2023, HHSA received the application and tentative agreement that REACH Air Medical Services submitted to provide emergency air ambulance services to persons within the boundaries of Tulare County. REACH will be based out of the Porterville Airport. Through this agreement, they will be responsible for furnishing air medical transport services inclusive of critical care by providing emergency medical services to persons in need within Tulare County. If the board approves this, REACH will provide air medical um, ambulance services on a non-exclusive basis. Tulare County Health and Human Services currently has a non-exclusive air ambulance services agreement with Air Methods, which operates under Skylife. This agreement was approved by the board on April 4th, 2017, with a contract period through March 31st, 2026. The agreement with REACH Air Medical Service will increase the capacity for air ambulance medical services in Tulare County. In order to bring this um, application for service forward, the department must follow county ordinance part six, chapter seven, that provides the guidance and steps for establishing new agreements to this type of service. The uh, requirements based on this ordinance include an application signing 
um, aligning with the requirements of Ordinance 675000 approved by the Public Health Director, an application fee, a public hearing to be held no later than 45 days after completion of application has been filed. Public Health has been working with our contracts and County Council to follow all required steps. Um, all, app all application materials have been submitted and approved by County Council to include an application meeting the requirements of Ordinance 675000. A scheduled public he hearing and published notice, the 45-day requirement has been waived. A categorical, category, a CEQA <laughs> has been developed. <laughs> An agreement between County and REACH Air Medical Services has been established. An established fee has been provided to REACH Medical Services to procure a business license within the county to be paid if the board approves this agreement. I also do have um, REACH representatives here. I have Daniel Laniquez, Regional Manager, and Danny Gorenson, Local Manager, and they are here to provide some additional information. Thank you. Come on up. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Daniel Inigas. I'm the regional director for Reach Air Medical for this base. Um, like was stated, is going to be located. Um, is currently located at the Portobello Airport. Airport. We are currently um, already in service in in our limited capacity. Um, that, that we're hoping to expand on today. So currently, um, outside of this, we're allowed to provide IFT services, so interfacility transport with the nurse-nurse model, um, which we've already been um, pretty successful in doing in, in serving the county. Um, so really, I just want to say we're, we're, we're humbled and honored to be here today for this consideration. Uh, we're, we're very much looking forward to being part of this community. Uh, our, our Pilots, our paramedics, our nurses, uh, most of them are from this county, have worked in this county, and, and are really excited to just be a part of a, of a new county for our family. Uh, we currently have over 50 air bases across seven states. So even so we're, we're new to Tulare County, but we're not new to this um, emergency air services uh, game. And locally, we have bases in Merced, in Stockton, in Modesto, in Madera, um, that are all very successful bases. Uh, so we're just really excited. Um, Supervisor Townsend, I, I appreciate your calls and um, you know, and just just your commitment to your area. Um, and 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 like like was stated, this is an, an increase in emergency services and and during times that are are challenging for healthcare sectors um, that that I've heard talked about in, in meetings in the past. It's never a bad thing to have high quality additional emergency services. And we, we greatly look forward to um, serving this county and, and the outlying areas being a part of the, the emergency services here, helping the hospitals, helping the fire departments, helping um, the other air providers in our area and to just uh, be a part of this community for a long time. Uh, hi, Danny Gornson. Um, I've, I've grown up in this area and this has been a long, long, long time dream uh, to be able to help the services in this. I uh, started in the fire department as a, like a volunteer firefighter, um, went into a uh, ground ambulance and then, you know, started flying about 10 years ago. Um, so I've always known this need. I've got two kids in the local communities that are police officers and you know, to support that, the, the services of the police, fire, EMS, the hospitals, has just been a, a great opportunity to, to, to be a part of this project. Thank you. And by the way, I should have opened the public hearing. <laughs> it's open. <laughs> um, we also have Dan Lynch and Dale Dodson from Fresno County um, Emergency Medical Services Agency. If there's any other questions, but at this point, I'll turn it over to you for public hearing. Okay, very good. Any uh, members of the board have questions at this time? Supervisor Vanderpool. You know, no questions. I just want to make a comment that I'm glad that it was highlighted that this is going to expand geographic services uh, for air medical transport into uh, more uh, predominance in the Porterville area. I think it's very important that we have uh, medical uh, transport services throughout this county 
um, and I appreciate Reach uh, for your interest and uh, dedication to uh, the south part of Tulare County. Uh, this is just a great thing, especially in a geographically large community like the one that we represent. So I'm really happy to see this move forward. Thank you. Any other questions, comments at this time? Okay, don't, I don't see any. So at this time, we'll take public testimony for anyone in the audience who wishes to speak on this matter. Does anyone wish to speak here in the audience? Mr. Mr. Chair, I do have public comment forms. If those who um, submitted would like to speak, Kyle Beaver. Good morning. Good morning, board and public uh, community members. Um, so I'm here representing Reed Chair Medical as well as a community member myself. Um, I've been in public service since 2009 as EMT. Worked as a paramedic locally since 2013 when I got my nurse's license, worked at Cuya Delta, um, various capacities. I've with, been with Reach for the last year. Um, and I'm just happy to be here to provide this service. This county, like you said, is geographically large, especially the southern and eastern regions where that's kind of the opposite corner of where Sky Life is currently located. Um, the air ambulance that we did purchase for this area is a high performance bird. So a lot of the high altitude rescues and stuff like that, we can augment the capacities that are currently in place. Um, so that's basically it. I'm just happy to be here and working locally again. You're good, thank you. Do we have any more comment cards? Anthony Sakulo. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Anthony Sakula, flight paramedic with Reach Air Medical Services. Uh, I just wanted to give a little bit of background about me. I've been living in the Central Valley for the past 14 years, UC Merced graduate, and uh, working as a paramedic in the Central Valley for about eight years now. So I'm really excited to have this opportunity to continue to serve the Central Valley, especially in this capacity and here in uh, Tulare County. Thank you. Abby Barfield. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm a clinical education manager for Reach Air Medical. Um, I oversee four bases throughout the Central Valley. And I just want to say what a, a great program we have. We have a very skilled uh, clinician team that can transport very sick patients from hospitals to the areas where they need care, as well as provide emergency services and get trauma patients to where they need to be very quickly. Um, we have a very large footprint for this company, so we're able to um, service your area through this base. We're very excited to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jennifer Capocella. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you for having us. Um, I'm Jennifer Capicella. I'm uh, homegrown, uh, born and raised in Visalia. Grew up in this county. Um, went to school at uh, College of the Sequoias, where I received my nursing license. Um, went on to work for our local hospital for uh, 20 years before getting involved in air, med air medical transport. Um, I've seen firsthand just, you know, comparing it to the hospital um, and, and the great work that's done there. Um, these employees that we have are highly skilled and they offer um, a great service to our community. Um, so it's very important. Um, I work closely with the Valley Children's team. That's my um, home base and um, also within Merced County. And um, it, this, this service would provide such an adjunct to, to those uh, teams that we have, um, especially our Valley Children's team. Um, they are often, um, you know, requested throughout the Valley, Bakersfield, um, Merced, beyond, um, because it's a, such a regional specialty center um, that this aircraft would be a very, very beneficial backup to our program there. So thank you for considering. Thank you. Mr. Chair, that concludes public comment cards. Okay, that's all the comment cards. Anyone else wishing to speak on this matter? 
I don't see any. Do we have any emails? We do not. All right, and with that, uh, we'll go ahead and close the public testimony time, and I'll bring this back to uh, the board for any more discussion, or if you feel the need to go to closed session. Yes, Supervisor Shucklian. If not, I was going to make a motion, but I just want to say I, I do support this. As been said, we are a very <clears> large <throat> county. I recently attended the 10-year anniversary for the helipad at Cuya Delta. They've had over 2,000 uh, flights uh, into there, and I'm, I'm sure there's a need uh, for more access uh, here in Tulare County for this emergency uh, medical need. So I would move approval if there's no other comments, but there is. Oops. Okay, all right. <laughs> We're going to have a comment. You want to have a comment first? You can. Okay. Well, I'll make a comment real quick. There was a motion and a second. Uh, moved by uh, Supervisor Sheckley and seconded by Vice Chair uh, Makari. But I will say also it is exciting. And also you had uh, mentioned the uh, uh, the higher altitude and so the mountain, uh, the mountainous terrains and the, and the hills. So we're looking forward to uh, having another, uh, another group that's able to uh, be responsible uh, in those areas. So thank you for bringing that forward. And so we have a motion by Supervisor Sheckley and second by Vice Chair Makari. Cast your votes. Hurry up for a ride. <laughs> that item passes unanimously. <laughs> Thank you. Strictly recreational, not medical. And I will also close the public hearing that I opened late. Okay. All right, and with that, we will move to our untimed items, starting with item number 32. And this is a request from General Services Agency to declare the existence of an emergency within the meaning of Public Contract Code 1102 and Public Resource Code 1060.3 due to the failure of the Leadbetter Park well. Wait, Good morning, what? Brooke. Oh, I'm sorry. We have... Oh, okay, yeah, this is item 32. And uh, uh, Vice Chair Macari has a recusal again. So uh, for item 32, uh, it has been brought to my attention that within the 12 months prior to the time this matter was submitted to the board for a decision, I received a campaign contributions of more than $250 from party or agents of a party with respect to today's agenda item number 32, which is a request to award a contract for Leadbetter Park well design and construction project to Willis Equipment Engineering Company Incorporated. For that reason, under Government Code Section 84308, I must recuse myself from making, participating in making, voting on, or in any way using my position as a supervisor to influence a decision regarding this agenda item. Therefore, I am excusing myself from this part of the board meeting and will not discuss or take part in the government decision with respect to this matter. The clerk is requested to make this announcement part of the official public record for today's meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair McCurry. If this gig doesn't work out, you can uh, take up those commercials where they lead the, read the legal stuff at the end. I think you got a career in that. They're, they're trying to silence you. This, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Brooke Sesk, our GSA director. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board, CAO Britt, Council Flores, Brooke Sisk, General Services Agency Director. And I'm here today to request the declaration of an emergency due to the failure of the well at Leadbetter Park. After the well collapsed earlier this year, we unsuccessfully attempted to repair it. And as this well is the only source of irrigation at Leadbetter Park and is no longer functioning properly, there is a high risk of losing trees and other vegetation the longer we go without it, especially as the hot summer months are upon, it, upon us. As such, an emergency declaration will allow us to procure services to construct a new well more quickly. Excuse me, $100,000 for this project was approved as part of the capital improvement plan for the fiscal year 2022-23 budget, and additional funds were allocated during the mid-year budget process after we discovered it needed more than just repairs. So the requests before you today are to declare an emergency due to the failure of the well, declare this action is necessary to respond to the emergency, award a sole source contract to Willits in the amount of $288,000 to design, construct, and install the new well and related improvements, declare the improvements are exempt from CEQA and direct the environmental assessment officer to file a notice of exemption, direct staff to agendize this declaration for review every 14 days, and authorize the chair to sign the agreement. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you. Do we have any questions for Brooke? No, no. 
We have one from Supervisor Valero. Uh, not a question per se, but just a comment. Thank you for bringing this to our attention and, and taking swift action on something that is, um, yeah, really making an impact. I know that Ledbetter Park is uh, a park that is utilized by many in our communities. And so again, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any other comments? All right, any from the public? Hearing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Hey, we have a motion by Supervisor Shackley and seconded by Supervisor Vanderpool and cast your votes. And this item is approved with uh, four to nothing with one absent, which is Vice Chair McCarry. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody back there to get him. <laughs> okay, we will move on to item number 33. That's to, I think, oh, wait one second. I don't want them to miss the good stuff. <laughs> hey, you're not McCurry. There he is. All right. <laughs> All right, this is item number 33. We receive a presentation from the Health and Human Services Agency regarding the contracted behavioral health services in Tulare County criminal justice facilities. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman, members of the board, CAO Britt, County Council Flores. My name is Cecilia Herrera. I'm Division Manager with Public Health. I'm accompanied today by Dr. Natalie Bowen, Director of Behavioral Health Services from HHSA. We're here to present to you um, information on criminal justice behavioral health services. Um, I'll be presenting a brief background, some statistics. Dr. Bolin will be providing you um, an overview on the services such as precision, behavioral health uh, service categories, contract cost, and I'll go ahead and conclude with the ongoing challenges and the request made before you today. Um, so for context, the Board of State Community um, Corrections is one entity which oversees the California Code of Regulations. Um, all county detention facilities are mandated to provide what we are ca calling essential medical and behavioral health services to individuals incarcerated at our detention facilities. So that includes both adult and juveniles. Um, Tulare County Public Health Department and Behavioral Health Department, we partner to meet those mandates that are pressed um, upon us. Um, this year, I'm very proud to announce and share um, that Tulare County was awarded an accreditation, which again recognizes the work that's being um, delivered by the National Commission of Correctional Health Care. They're an entity that again helps um, to provide governance ensure care and um, health promotion as well as legal issues at the facilities. So just to provide you some context, um, in 2012, uh, the Board of Supervisors and um, the county as a whole went out to a request for proposals. We requested um, bids from vendors that were interested in providing comprehensive health and men behavioral health care services at the detention facilities. So um, as a conclusion of that RFP, the board decided to go ahead and contract out those services. We selected Corizon and that vendor was awarded a three-year agreement with an option to extend for two years. So we went ahead and entered into agreement with them. Again, they did a comprehensive care model for us at the jails. In 2018, we went out to RFP again. We selected a California Forensics Medical Group and went ahead and contracted with them until the year of 2022. In 2022, we went through a third RFP. Um, this one was a little bit different in the sense of the evaluation committee came back and made a recommendation to separate from one single agreement into two. And so we are now going to be talking a little bit more about a two contract model. So the two contract model, what happened is we um, placed into two categories. The first was medical services will be provided or are being provided by WellPath. 
and the um, service elements include medical, dental, vision, pharmaceutical, and utilization management. And then the behavioral health care services were provided by Precision. And that, again, we do have a list of items noted there to include behavioral health, enhanced mental health services, um, med medication. medication, assisted therapy, sorry, it's called MAT, I'm used to abbreviations, substance use disorder, um, new programs such as gel-based competency and gel-based treatment. Um, so we'll go ahead and lean the conversation a little bit more towards precision and behavioral health now. So we went ahead and contracted with precision in June of 22. Um, we did an amendment just recently to add an um, EASE, which is a state program. It's funded by the state. And then um, briefly, just to provide you some statistics, um, in the combination between sheriff and probation, this is data provided by sheriff and probation, the average daily population served is um, the individuals that are within the facility. The average daily population is given to us on a monthly average. Um, what you can see here with this data is a demonstration that the ADP has decreased over a period of time. So in 1819, we had about 1,500 and has had a steady decline over the last few years to what we estimate 1,000. Um, it's 1172 for this fiscal year. So that just gives you a, a very general overview of some of the um, data. I'm gonna go ahead and hand that over to Dr. Bowen. Good morning. Well, I'm very excited to come before you um, to outline a continuing contract with Precision Psychiatric Services. And we have many here from Precision today in our board, so thank you for joining us. Um, Precision is a local company. They're based out of Kern County. They have over 10 years of experience of providing psychiatric and clinical services in an array of arenas. So they're contracted um, as a mental health provider for Kauia Health, Tulare County Office of Education, um, Kings County Behavioral Health, and they also staff Good Samaritan down in Kern County. They support um, the robust psychiatry residency program out of Kauia Health. When you look at this contract, it's really four different contracts under one umbrella. So we have our adult behavioral health contract, we have our youth behavioral health, and then we have our adult ease, which we came to the board on May 9th, that's the early access and stabilization services, and our adult adult jail-based competency treatment. And both of those are funded completely by the Department of State Hospitals, DSH, but we include them under the umbrella of this contract. So looking back at fiscal year 22-23, um, this was the mental health-based contract for both adult and juvenile at $8.5 million, and this was with an ADP of 1,700. And as Cecilia just presented to you, for this next fiscal year, we are working off an ADP of 1,200. And so the, this is reflective in the budget decrease from 8.5 million down to 6.8 million. And that is for both adult and juvenile. So a breakdown in the precision contract by category our adult behavioral health services is at $5.8 million expenses, and below is the outline of revenue that covers that portion of the contract. So we have mental health realignment, our general fund, AB 109, and our mental health block, block grant. For adult ease, um, this is a DSH funded um, program, you will see under the adult JBCT that there is um, a portion of it that has not been reimbursed by DSH, and we are in active negotiations to get that. So as of today, we are using mental health realignment to patch that, 
but again, we are in conversation with DSH to fully fund this program. And then for youth behavioral health services, um, we have probation funding, DJJ realignment, and also our youth offender block grant. So going over the services that's, that are provided, it's, it's the full menu of crisis intervention, assessments, therapy, uh, medication management. Importantly to note in voluntary medication order that this vendor has been providing, which wasn't provided in previous contracts. And so we see really good results um, through this medication management. They also look at discharge planning and respond to suicide prevention. They provide substance use disorder and then as um, stated, medication assisted treatment or what we refer to as MAT services. This is the EASE program and this is um, once an inmate is kind of in that pipeline as incompetent to stand trial, um, this is an early um, stabilization services where inmates can start receiving services prior to being in one of the DSH program. So it's for those that are on a waiting list for JBCT. And this goes over ease. I know we brought this to the board um, and this information was included on May 9th. Um, but again, it just provides timely mental health and psychiatric services for those that are on the waiting list for JBCT. For our JBCT program, um, we have caught the attention of the state because of our early outcomes. We actually had a, um, a visit from the state back in January wanting to know what are we doing differently. Um, we are the only county that is contracted with a pro private vendor, a local vendor. All the other JBCT programs are um, being done by one vendor that the state contracts with. And as you can see, our outcomes are outpacing the state's outcomes. And so they wanted to come and see us and find out what we're doing differently. And I can say that um, in-person psychiatry and just the intensive daily programming that is being done is showing great results. And I will turn it over to Cecilia to finish. Thank you. So um, this just wanted to give you a brief landscape of what's to come, what we kind of anticipate with the criminal justice and service deliveries. Um, we do see an increase of cost of services that are increasing associated with salaries for licensed staff. We have Title 15 reform, and these are really policy changes that come to pipe down, down the pipeline. Um, one of the leading changes going on today are Cal Ames which is going to create linkages with medical insurance for inmates as they're being discharged, a higher level of linkage for discharge planning and coordinated care for the individuals receiving services. And then there's the restoration of individuals um, that are housed at the facilities as we um, move forward. So these are some of the anticipated landscape changes that we um, are moving forward with. I do wanna take a moment to acknowledge that services at the detention facilities is a collaborative effort, which requires a lot of partners at the table. Um, again, the board being at the forefront of that, the CAO, the sheriff, probation, county council, HSA, and precision. So it's a, a, a large group of uh, partnerships that are um, constantly working together to ensure that the services are delivered um, to the individuals. And that concludes this. Um, I'd like to formally request again that the board receive the presentation on the contracted behavioral health services at the Tulare County Criminal Justice Facilities and approve the agreement with Precision to deliver comprehensive behavioral health, gel-based therapy and ease um, in the amount not to exceed 10.6 million for the upcoming fiscal year and then authorize the chairman to sign the agreement. And I'm open for any questions, as is Dr. Bullen. Very good, thank you for the presentation. Do we have any questions or comments from the board? Yes, Supervisor Vanderpool. Thank you for the 
uh, presentation this morning. It's great to uh, see the effectiveness of our uh, JVCT program. I mean, uh, to get the attention of the state to come down and to see what we're doing means that we're doing something right. And I think that it's the rigorous treatment uh, and the rigorous program uh, that a somewhat local vendor is implementing here. Um, in our jails, I, I think that the outcomes are, are definitely uh, a result of all the effort that's going into it and uh, the in-person treatment, I think that, that hit the nail right on the head too because uh, when you're treated on a computer screen or over a phone, it's not the same as the in-person interaction. Uh, and so we really are helping to uh, transform and hopefully improve the outcomes of our uh, jail inmates uh, as they move forward in their sentences and in their lives. So uh, really happy to see that. It is a very expensive contract. Uh, even though our uh, average daily population is going down, uh, this contract has increased significantly over time. Um, and I know that uh, labor costs have increased as well. There's a lot of things that are driving uh, these cost increases. And so even though the contract amount <clears throat> is going down, per inmate, um, the cost is actually going up. So um, I, I really want to make sure that we do keep focused on what's driving these costs and uh, what services we are requiring or requesting uh, our vendors to provide in the jails. I, I want to make sure that we're doing so uh, with a fiscal outlook in mind that obviously is going to favor uh, positive outcomes, but also uh, being mindful of uh, limited resources that we have as a county. So uh, just uh, wanted to put that out there and I do appreciate you bringing this forward and hope that it continues to be successful. Thanks, Supervisor Vanderpool. Vice Chair McCurry. Well, I want to say thank you for the presentation, and I, I want to thank our, our staff, and I want to thank Precision for coming to the table and, and working on this. And actually, we're, you know, I know that we've talked, Supervisor Vanderpool mentioned how costs are increasing, and we know that. However, you've managed to be able to save on the general fund side of this, which when we did this last time was a, actually a last minute thing, and it was a, quite an impact to the general fund. So you actually uh, worked together you worked on it, you provided, we are providing some uh, great services, because a lot of, we didn't used to have this. They used to have to be sent out of county. I know I worked in the jail and there's people sitting there waiting forever for a bed, and uh, all they would do is sit there and suffer and linger, and then we'd send them out at an enormous cost to us. So there is a, a savings. Uh, we are providing a much better quality of service, and uh, I, I think you all deserve some recognition for actually finding funding sources to lessen the impact on the general fund and to bring a quality service. I, I've heard a lot of great things about Precision, so I'm really excited that we are we were able to continue that. So uh, thank you for your diligence. You know, I know you'll continue to look at it, and uh, some things are out of our control, but I really appreciate the diligence put into this. Thank you. I'll also follow up on that, that uh, that that was one of the items that on one of our HHSA check-ins that we talked about and you highlighted the jail-based competency and uh, I was pretty impressed with that, especially the little chart with the outcomes of uh, uh, compared to statewide, um, those, uh, those savings and uh, just the, re the results uh, are really, really great to hear. Any other uh, comments from the board, questions? Uh, any from the public? Yes. Good morning. How are you doing? Good morning. <laughs> I'm doing good. Good. Um, Aaron Brooks, Public Defender's Office. I just wanted to make a brief comment in support of Precision. Um, my office um, has um, had nothing but good things to say about their interactions with Precision and their staff. Um, I was involved in the RFP process, and um, from the start, they were very eager to hear what um, our needs were from our perspective from the Public Defender's Office. They've always been um, easy to get a hold of, um, just willing to do whatever it takes to make this work in our county. We haven't had that before. We haven't had these services before. We haven't had the um, uh, focus on in-person psychiatric um, uh, visits, which is really important. Like you said, over the video isn't always the best for our clients who are suffering from serious mental illness in the jail. So I just wanted to express my support. Um, they've worked 
last minute with our attorneys, our social workers, getting, make sure medication and release planning. So anyway, um, <coughs> we've had nothing but um, good working relationship with them. And so I just wanted to express my support for them. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Do we have any others? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is uh, Minty Dillon. I'm the CEO for Precision. I just wanted to, first of all, um, thank you for giving us the opportunity uh, to truly partner with Tulare County. I am a long-term resident of Tulare County, been here, grew up in Porterville since 81, worked at Quia Health for about 20 years and worked with many individuals throughout the county. Um, our desire here is to uh, truly partner with the county and improve the overall health of our community as well as the specific uh, agenda item that we're talking about here at uh, the jail system. And so we, again, thank you and look forward to partnering with you in the upcoming year. We're all um, committed, uh, most of us live here in Tulare County. I currently live in Exeter. Um, while our offices are in Kern County, that's just a physical address, the majority of the team does reside in Tulare County and we're very invested in our community and to make it a better place for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? All right, I don't see any, so I will bring it back to the board. And we have a motion by Vice Chair Makari for approval. We have a second by Supervisor Shecklin. We can cast our votes. And the item is approved five to nothing. Thank you. Thank you all for presenting. And next, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm number 34. Receive a presentation from the Resource Management Agency that provides updates on the completed projects within the 2022-23 fiscal year from the County Transportation Improvement Program. This was uh, put on the agenda a while back to, uh, to highlight uh, all the good work that's going on over at RMA. Uh, even though it ended up being toward the end of the agenda, we're still highlighting it, so. <laughs> but, um, and I noticed it's titled Building the Future by Driving Forward. So the theme this year, Building the Future, I see what you did there, adding the little driving forward thing. Yes. That's pretty Thank slick. <laughs> All right. Good morning, Reed Shanky. Shanky with the Resource Management Agency. Thank you for having me today. Um, when I was here a few weeks back for the approval of the 23-24 CTEP, I promised a return with update on projects that we had been completing in the past 12 months or so. Here we are. Um, as Chairman Townsend mentioned, it's excellent timing. Uh, with his emphasis on the um, physical infrastructure building the county, um, I think of it as physical infrastructure and human capital investments. Uh, in the county that are made to keep us driving forward. We do like our puns at over RMA, road puns in particular. Um, there's no specific action required for you here today, so you can sit back and just uh, appreciate the presentation and the work that our crews have been doing over the past year. Um, happy to answer any questions or feedback. If you wanna stop me along the way, feel free. Um, I'll go over some of the budget and funding items and then hit a highlight of a range of road projects. It's hard to pick just a few, so I kind of picked some that sort of identify um, the various types of projects that we work on. And these are all stemming out of the CTIP, which you approve annually. Uh, the CTIP is our county transportation improvement program, and that kind of sets the tone for the next year and identifies the projects that we'll be working for in the coming years. This slide here shows our projected revenues for 23-24. Um, it does exclude uh, all of the revenues or the funds that we expect to recoup from storm-related damages. If you were to put that on the slide, it would throw everything out of whack. This is more typical of a normal year for us. Um, you can see about 75% of our roads revenues comes either from state SB1 and HUDA are state funds, that's basically gas tax or registration fees, or Measure R, which you're familiar with as our local uh, taxes. Um, so about 64, almost $65 million of revenue expected this year. Uh, of note, we don't uh, get any property tax or general fund supplementation. That's kind of a misconception that a lot of people have. I know you folks don't, but anyone listening, we oftentimes say, hey, I paid my property taxes. Why aren't my roads getting fixed? Well, this is where our road funding comes from. One other note in the slide there, the local transportation funds, or LTF, 
Um, we're transiting or transitioning, and maybe a bad pun there, but um, those are transit first funds, and the county is now a member of the Tulare County Transportation Authority, a JPA. So we don't really have direct uh, authority over those funds anymore. That's something that we kind of gave up. If you don't spend it in transit, then it falls back to roads so we can use that. So a little bit outside of our control. Um, we're currently looking at about $4 million in revenue coming from LTF. Uh, you've heard me say it's about 3,000 miles of roadway. You know that number. If you were to talk to the state, they've got a slightly different mapping system. They say it's about uh, 3,400 miles, um, about 90% rural roads, 10% more urban roads. Um, if you were to list us all in the top 10, including state and federal agencies, we're the sixth largest road network in the state. Um, just behind Fresno County. And then uh, something to note, just above LA County there with slightly more road miles. Uh, also listed some of the other jurisdictions. So City of Visalia, for example, has a little over 500 road miles. This slide here shows us really why we have to stretch the money the way we do. Um, Tulare County, we, we have, like I say, uh, from the state's allocation, about 3,400 miles. The way the state uh, allocates road funds in particular, uh, HUDA and SB1, is primarily based on population or vehicle registrations, which is basically a proxy for population. Um, about 75, 80% of the allocation is based on that number there. So high density, high population areas receive a lot more money than lower density, more rural areas like us. So I mentioned Tulare County and then comparing it to LA County, we have roughly the same vehicle or amount of maintained miles. But if you see there, LA County gets about $78,000 per mile, whereas we get almost a tenth of that, $7,000 per mile. So recognize it's more expensive to build freeways and urban roads, but we do have to stretch our dollar quite a bit further. Uh, you can see a number of other comparisons there that I just pulled up to kind of get so, a sense. So, Reed, for any of our any of our state legislators that are listening, this would be a great time to uh, consider changing the road funding formula to uh, to give a little bit of a nod to road miles maintained, because uh, as you said, Los Angeles County has uh, about a hundred less road miles and gets it more than ten times what we receive per road uh, mile maintained. Absolutely. Thanks. Just a little political plug, sorry. Um, road maintenance, uh, there's many factors that go into it, but ultimately it's a pretty direct relationship to how much money you have to be able to spend on the roads. Um, this chart here shows kind of the factor of if you spend a certain amount of dollars over the next 10 years, where our road conditions would be. Um, pavement condi condition index, PCI, is kind of the grade or the benchmark that we use to score roads. Uh, it's a score from zero to 100, but pretty much every road uh, falls within either a 35 to 85 range, 85 being on the upward side of a brand new road, 35 meaning something you pretty much can't drive on unless you got a four wheel drive high clearance vehicle. Uh, we're currently at a PCI of 62. That's up a couple of ticks. I think we were at 60 last year, um, but we hover around that 62, 60 range. Um, that puts us kind of on the bottom end of fare, and that is fairly consistent uh, with our other rural counties. So um, Kings, Kern, Fresno, those probably fall within a similar area there as us. Cities generally tend to have a slightly higher PCI rating um, somewhat a factor of that high density population uh, revenue allocation. If you put these numbers and a couple of assumptions uh, based on costs uh, into what we call our PMS or our pavement management system, this is a um, program that kind of calculates where we should be in theory spending the money um, and if we have X dollars, what that would result with. Um, that spits out this the fairly linear chart here. Um, if we wanted to get to a PCI of 75, which would bump us into the good range, uh, we're calculating we would need about 77 to maybe $80 million per year in just road maintenance. So that's not general operational stuff, but just asphalt maintenance money um, for the next 10 years. So that's a little bit more than double uh, where we currently are with our spending to get to a good range. Um, to maintain the PCI where we're at, we need about $38 million per year for the next 10 years. That's a little bit more than where we're at right now, 
Um, we're projecting that given kind of our, a flat line of what our current road revenues are um, in the next 10 years, we'd be down into 57, so kind of hovering in that 60 range there. Uh, another way to put this would be if you want to get to good or the high end of good, you need over $100 million per year for the next 10 years or a billion dollars to get to good. Now that's kind of a high achievement mark, um, probably not realistic when you figure all the other uh, demands on public funding, but that just gives you a sense of the, the need as far as road money goes. Getting into a couple of the highlights, um, like I say, I picked some just selective projects. We're not certainly covering all of them here in the next dozen slides or so. Uh, there's a lot to choose from, and I'm real proud of what we've done. Um, but we've got a broad range of repairs and maintenance covered in the next uh, few slides. Um, there's different types of projects pre completed. The, the past year was a big year for us, but it was no year, no, by no means an atypical year. I think this coming year, um, even if you take out all the damage repairs that we're going to be faced with, uh, it's a similar year with the same number of bridges, road repairs, et cetera. Um, getting into a couple specific projects here. Road rehab through overlays and pulverization is really our bread and butter type of project that we do. Uh, Teapot Dome is an example of that. Um, it's the primary treatment we use for bad, high volume, high speed roads, costing about $650,000 per mile is kind of what we budget currently. So that's gone up over the past five years. When I first really started digging into this, it was 350K and 500K, and now it's upwards of 650K. Um, teapot was done in conjunction with the new casino that went in and the increased projected traffic that we were seeing there, or that we would be seeing. Um, small modifications do make big improvements or big impacts here. With these projects, we added left turn lanes uh, to allow traffic to pull through, pull out of the main through line. Uh, these were a couple locations where we had vehicles running, uh, rear ending cars that were stopped to make that left turn. Um, so here you can see we've got Avenue 328, but we also did some um, recently on uh, Avenue 152 as well. Uh, these were funded through uh, federal HSIP, uh, Highway Safety Improvement Programs, and Measure R. Another example of kind of smaller improvements that make a big difference, um, traffic signals or lights at stop signs are a big deal. Uh, sometimes we'll put them on the stop sign or at stop ahead signs. Here we've got a couple examples of recent installations where we've got the overhead flashing beacons. Um, this, these are Road 164, Avenue 256, and then 140 at Avenue 240 near the school there. So uh, another example, they're somewhat time consuming for the dollar value, but they have a big impact for the location. Um, another one that we're kind of implementing is wider traffic stripes. If you've been on some of the newer paved roads, you may notice that the, tri the stripes look a little bit bigger. Um, that's a standard we're switching over to. It's a little bit more costly as far as paint and material goes, but has a big impact definitely in uh, fog prone areas where we can uh, provide that. These projects here, there's kind of a small carve out in federal funding to, to do this. So we were able to take advantage of that a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, we're also using more thermoplastic striping, which is kind of the melt on heated. It's got a higher reflectivity value and it lasts a few years longer. Um, you basically have to paint traffic stripes almost every two years. So it's kind of like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. As soon as you start and you stop, you get back and you start over again and you keep going. Thermoplastic lasts three to maybe upwards of five years. So a bit more costly up front, but longer lasting over the life of the project. Um, you're familiar with our chip seal program. I know a couple of you have been out and seen the train working. Another one that we're implementing here, this is the second year we've done it, is a slurry seal program. Uh, works very similar to chip seal, but instead of using the larger chip rock, it uses a sand um, in its place. This is more appropriate for residential areas. It gives a nice black, uh, smooth surface, and it prolongs the life of the roadway there. Uh, works real well in areas with curb and gutter where you don't have that loose chip rock to come loose. Um, did it in about nine or 10 locations this year, or this past year, um, and got a lot of good feedback from the residents of those areas. They appreciate that attention, probably something that they've never seen since the road was built. Um, so slurry seal is definitely something we're pursuing in the future as well. Uh, very progressive bridge program. Um, it's highly competitive. It's state and federally funded. 
Uh, we've got a, a large backlog of projects that we're eligible for, but you have to be in the right place at the right time and kind of know the right people to make it work. Um, Caltrans has been very um, receptive to our projects, and they've told us a couple times that they like programming our work because we do deliver the projects. This Avenue 424 project is an example of a tough one. Um, we actually bid it, awarded the project, and the contractor never really showed up. So we had to terminate that contract, get a new one on board, and our contractor here, AG Construction, jumped in and made it happen really quickly. So good project um, on the west side of Dinuba up in the North County. And just an example, kind of our typical bridge project, you know, nothing overly dramatic, just a, a nice bridge um, that uh, replaces some either narrow or structurally deficient infrastructure. Not all bridges need to be replaced. Um, as part of our bridge preventative maintenance program, we went out and assessed the over 350 on-system bridges, which is the bridges over 20 feet. We've got a whole heck of a lot more under 20 feet, but these are the, what, the bridges that are federally eligible for funding. So we went out, assessed them, identified the treatment methodology. Um, in this case, the picture here in the group one were projects that uh, were appropriately to be treated with methacrylate, which is a crack sealing, uh, kind of a slurry that you paint on there and it gets into the concrete and it restores and extends the life of the bridges there. So um, it's a really highly recommended uh, uh, maintenance uh, implementation. Um, but we do have other projects in the work for scour mitigation where the water washes out the abutments. Saw a lot of that this year with all the excess flows, um, guardrail replacements, that sort of thing. So uh, pretty active bridge preventative maintenance program. And as I said, uh, bread and butter is our overlay projects. Um, RRAA, these are, you can think of them as the SB1 projects. We call them the rah-rah projects because we get pretty, pretty excited about them. Um, we had a, a large RARA or overlay program last year. We did um, over about 35 miles of projects or of roadway through four major RRA projects. Um, there was a point last uh, October where I was driving from the office out to Wood Lake and it seemed like every turn I took, it was either a road under construction, something that had recently been paved or was going to be under construction. So I was pretty impressed with the team and how we were able to handle all of those at the same time. But it is making a difference out there. You start to drive these roads and you go, you know, we are, I think we're making headway, starting to feel it a little bit. May not be showing up totally in the PCI average, but these bigger roads really are starting to feel the difference. So um, SB1 has been a huge part of that. Uh, another RRA project, this one from our 2022 <coughs> allocation, um, in Central County, about 14 miles. I think this was actually our largest overlay project we've done in the history, or at least my history. Um, big job, fairly high dollar value, but uh, very good results that we're happy with. So you can see the list of all the locations that we're able to hit there. Uh, another one here, second from our 2022 RARA or SB1 allocation. Um, these uh, overlay jobs are generally designed for a 20 year lifespan. I know we're gonna squeeze more out of it than 20 years. Uh, it's just the nature of the resources that we have. Um, where appropriate, uh, we'll fully pulverize the existing <coughs> road service, meaning grind up the asphalt. Um, treat that so it uh, is equivalent to uh, an aggregate base, a class two aggregate base, and actually start building up a, cross, a section, a structural section for the roadway. In a lot of cases, these roads were just built kind of asphalt on native soil. So uh, looking towards the future, we're building up that base. The next overlay that comes in can do the same thing and you're actually building up a structural section. So each time you come in, those roads should last a bit longer. Uh, we do do a large amount of work with county forces, certainly not to mention the thousands of potholes that uh, we address and deal with every, uh, every year. Um, you know, they deal with signs that are down, replacements, uh, clearing shoulders, et cetera. But we've got a fully capable and competent uh, road crew that can do the bigger jobs as well. Um, state law limits what we can do on kind of the capital side to about 20% of what we do overall. So the majority of that work needs to go out to uh, contract, which is good because it allows our guys to kind of focus on the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, but like I say, we do have a very dedicated and uh, capable team of crews ourselves to do that this year or this past year. Did a little over five miles of roadway <coughs> rehab themselves. 
So that's kind of the, the main highlights of the types of projects we did, but looking into the future, what are our needs? And I'm sure you're very familiar with them, but um, we've talked about the, the bridge program. We've got 350 or so larger bridges and then another probably thousand or so smaller bridges and culverts, um, all of which will need to be addressed in the next few decades. Um, currently, we've got 19 years worth of what we call backlogged projects. These are projects that are eligible, ready to go, in need, um, considered structurally deficient, but just waiting federal funding. So the federal HBP program is highly oversubscribed. Everybody is having the same problem that we are. Um, so it's about getting in the list, getting in there early, and then waiting for the allocations. I think we've done a very good job with that. We'll use tools such as advanced construction, which is us fronting the money with local funds and then waiting for the funding to come. That kind of bumps us up to the higher point in the line. So um, a little bit outside the box thinking or taking a risk on that, but I think it's been effective in the past. So a lot of bridge needs, um, certainly a lot of road needs. We've got the you know 3,000-ish miles of roadway and the grid-like pattern throughout the county. Um, just due to resource allocations, we have to focus on the more highly used roads, the bigger roads, but we can't forget the smaller roads, the roads that are um, you know, really critical to the dairies, the farms, the packing houses that serve these locations. So we have to balance that need quite a bit and we do that through identifying farm to market routes. Um, and this is a little bit of, you know, you talked about kind of a political agenda. If we can push any kind of funding to help with farm to market routes, that's a big one. That would be a big win for us. So we recognize the economic importance of these roads throughout the county. Um, and then we got to recognize that there's a human factor too. Roads weren't just built for cars, they were built for the people who use the roads, drive the cars, walk the roads, walk the sidewalks, ride their bikes. Um, we've got a number of communities that just don't have the basic pedestrian infrastructure that a lot of more urban uh, settings are, are accustomed to and really take for granted. Uh, we've done a number of sidewalk jobs. They're pretty time consuming, uh, fairly costly on a location perspective. They don't get the 14 miles of sidewalks like a roadway job does, but they do have a big impact. This photo here is early Mart. There was a stretch of sidewalk in front of the park there that needed to be replaced. So um, again, making a big impact for the communities in the region. This slide, in closing, this is my last slide, so you can see the end is near. Um, it's a slide I presented to the California Transportation Commission, and it basically highlights that, um, you know, without the, the foresight and the investment in infrastructure that the people who came before us made, um, whether it be the, the water infrastructure, the railroads, or when they built the roads in the first place, uh, we really wouldn't be the community that we are today. So it really is that infrastructure, I think, that allows Tulare County to be what it is. Um, we've got a lot of good growth uh, and uh, opportunity in the future with solar, with emerging technologies, but we've got to continue that investment in our roadways and in our infrastructure. Um, so it's quite a bit and it's blatantly road focused, but it's not RMA's only effort or activity that we do in the coming weeks here. Um, we're going to be coming back to you with kind of presentation on economic development opportunities, code enforcement, building inspections, that sort of thing. I know Mike's working on that presentation right now. Um, I want to thank you for your support. Your board has been uh, very supportive of the road issues. Uh, anything we ever need, you're, you're willing to help us out and hear us out with, so I really do appreciate that interest. Um, you're oftentimes the liaison or the go-between between between the public and us. And I respect that, I appreciate that. I know it's challenging for you to get the calls and get the pothole requests, but do keep passing them forward to us. We need that feedback and I, I do um, appreciate that feedback. Um, we take pride in our responsiveness and we do hold ourselves to a high standard. There is a lot to do and I know we don't get to all of them, um, but we do take that very seriously. Um, I, I wanna acknowledge the staff that actually delivers these projects. They're not here with me today. They're back in the office working, bringing up the next set so we can have some more pictures for you next year. Um, but they do work very hard and they take it very seriously. Um, this area is our home, it's their home. Uh, we're proud of it and we wanna take care of it. Just like you take care of your own personal living space, you know, these guys live and breathe these roads. It's home to them and it's very important what we do. So um, with that, uh, again, just wanna thank you for your support and happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Reed, and we have one by uh, Vice Chair McCurry. 
It's more of a, a comment than a question. I, I just want to thank you and staff for your responsiveness. I know you guys just feel like you're just getting beat on, especially now after the flooding and what we've had. But uh, I can't state you or everybody's been responsive. I know that you know things have to take time, but there's one particular incident that someone contacted me and I reached out to you in an email and you said, hey, we'll send somebody out. And it was luck of the draw. It was like 15 minutes later and he says, man, they're out here patching already. He says, you know, so, uh, you just, you guys happen to be in the area, you know, it worked out, but uh, everybody's been responsive of it. The, the one thing that, that I'm encountering more is, and it's like anything else, people want to complain, but they don't report. And I know that you do what you can to uh, put out there, you know, to, to report the, the uh, road concerns that we have, because how else can we get them on a list to fix them? Is there a program we can do? to really push that. I'm, I'm handing out the pamphlets, I'm giving them the web page uh, information and trying to get everyone to work together to report it. And we can't fix them all at once. Obviously they have to fall in line and, and, and be prioritized as to from bad to worse. But I, I, that's the one thing that I'm encountering is more and more people just say they want to complain about it, they don't know who to call even though we, we talk about it frequently. So. I mean, I don't know, maybe the board level, we can do something on our side about reporting. I, just just a thought, but uh, I do want to thank you for your tentatives and, and how fast you guys are responding and doing the best you can with what you have. Appreciate that. My kids right now are really into the movie The Incredibles, and they, you know, like anybody, they look up their dad and they go, you're Mr. Incredible. I feel more like Elastigirl, you know, sometimes you're stretched in so many <laughs> different directions. Um, but uh, I, I do appreciate that. We can do more about getting our, our information out, how to report that. Like you say, if we don't know it, <clears throat> particularly for things that are safety concerns, stop signs that are down or damaged, um, but pothole requests, other things, you know, we've got our website, we've got our phone number, 64, 7,000, anybody that's listening, that's the easiest way. We've got direct lines to the road yards for people to call and their staff during business hours. Um, so we got to know about it to get it on the list. And frankly, if we don't know about it and we're, maybe it's a pothole, but if we get the, a number of those calls, it rises to the attention and that's how they get on our list for overlays and the bigger uh, responses as well. So. Um, yeah, if there's any ideas or anything that we could be doing better to, to get that information out, certainly receptive to that. Very good. And re by the way, Mr. Incredible's already taken. You'll have to find another uh, persona. <laughs> so we have uh, Supervisor Valero. Well, I just want to say again, thank you for all the hard work. Um, and I, similar to what Supervisor Makari said there, I, when I'm in the grocery store or walking to an event, I have many people that will say, well, this road needs to be fixed or that road. Uh, but again, it's encouraging them to write it down, to send it so that way we can then communicate that back to our May, uh, sharing it at the web on the website. Um, there are several counties that I've noticed that also have like an app where they take the picture and it can send it directly to. So maybe that's something that we can look for in the future uh, as we continue to find ways to, again, create that um, access to, but also time sensitive as well. Uh, but nonetheless, like I said, um, the recent storms and the natural disasters have really um, shown light in terms of the roads and the work that we need to do. But I just ask our communities to be very patient um, because there are a lot that we still need to do as a result of these storms. And, and yes, staff will get to them as, as quick as they can, uh, but do know that, again, RMA is working diligently to uh, make our roads um, better than they are post-storm related activities. Supervisor Vanderpool. Thanks for the update, Reed. Uh, I think it's uh, a uh, huge monumental task to uh, take on the roads when you need double the road funding that we are currently uh, receiving every year for the next 10 years uh, to even make our road network in general to be considered good or above average. So um, it's, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, but I think it's really important you highlighted the need for a prioritization of farm to market routes, not only for the uh, economic value that it generates, but what that does is if you look throughout the county, that creates a pretty a reliable network of east to west, north to south uh, thoroughfares throughout the county that not only farm to market 
uh, vehicles can rely upon, but residents can rely upon too for good, stable roads that they can <clears throat> rely on to get where they're going safely and not having to worry about uh, potholes. I think it's really important that we continue to set aside a rapid response uh, allocation of our uh, CTIP, which is what we've done. Um, that is really important so that we can respond to constituent calls. We are reactive, as has been mentioned, uh, so people do need to uh, call these potholes in, call in the road conditions, and we'll get there. Uh, I, it does take some time. Uh, resources are limited, but uh, the more calls we get, the, the better we'll be able to respond. Uh, I also want to say I think it's really important that uh, uh, we highlight the fact that our road crews do depend primarily on the number of vehicles and, and the average daily traffic. However, that's not the only thing that drives what we do. Uh, I've received a call from a constituent in Teveson uh, last week thanking us for the work that has been done in Teveson. I bet that probably has one of the lowest ADTs uh, in the county but it's important and it matters to the residents that live there. So um, we have to make sure uh, that we don't neglect the isolated communities that may not have uh, the highest number of ADT, uh, but those roads do matter to the residents that live there. So I appreciate the work that you've done and I look forward to uh, continuing to advocate for farm market roads and additional uh, looks at how we can possibly tweak the road funding formula to create some more equity in the road funding arena. Thanks. Very good. And, and you know, uh, I'd just add to that, um, Reed, I know one of the first questions that I had was based on the pavement condition index and, you know, where we stood uh, based on the state, the little the chart that you had there uh, indicates that uh, very well. And uh, really happy to see that that, I think it was 60 before and it ticked up to 62. And I think it's a good, uh, I know one of the first questions I asked, what does it take to get it to, you know, the, the up there in the good level, and uh, your answer of a billion dollars kind of floored me uh, how much it was. And so, obviously, we had to take it in incremental uh, bites, and that's what you've been doing. And, and going forward, I can see us just doing the same thing as much as we can. I know you're out there chasing every, every project, every dollar uh, that we can get, and we'll continue to do that. <clears throat> Supervisor Vanderpool also mentioned the farm to market, which every single time that we're uh, that we're in DC or talking to uh, any of our uh, legislators there, we're always looking for the farm to market, which have been very successful in get, getting awarded some of those over the years. So we look forward to more and more to come. And um, thank you for all the great work for taking the time you and your staff to uh, to highlight what RMA is doing uh, on all of our the county roads and bridges, and to kind of give a highlight for uh, each of the the districts was very helpful. Appreciate it. Thank you. Till Thank next you time. Yes. All right. Now we'll take us to uh, item number 35. We have a request from the Human Resources uh, and Development Department to approve salary increases for unrepresented employees and specified bargaining units and other benefits. Lupe Garza. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Townsend, members of the board. Lupe Garza, Human Resources Director. Um, this morning, the item before you is um, is an item to approve salary increases for unrepresented employees in bargaining units 9, 10, 11, 19, 20, and 21, and other compensation and benefit changes. Um, specifically, I need to read the read in the request for the record that you're being asked to approve for unrepresented employees. So um, there's quite a bit of items. So number one. Um, for unrepresented employees in bargaining units 10, 11, 19, 20, and 21, a 4% 4, a 4 salary increase effective July 2nd, 2023, and a 3% salary increase effective June 30th, 2024. This includes local agency executives as de defined in California Government Code Section 3511, but it excludes other county officials and the Board of Supervisors. For unrepresented employees in bargaining unit nine, which is probation institution supervisor and probation officer supervisor, a 4% salary increase, a 3% equity increase effective July 2nd, 2023, and a 4% salary increase effective June 30th, 2024. For unrepresented attorneys in bargaining units 11 and 20, 
Exhibit A includes um, it includes a list of the, name, the, the positions. A 2% equity increase effective June 30th, 2024. For unrepresented fire battalion chiefs in bargaining unit 19, a 5% equity increase effective July 2nd, 2023. Bilingual pay increase from 50 cents per hour to 63, 63 cents per hour. Continuation of the county's matching contribution, which is a, for every dollar, every county dollar contributed, contributed it for every four employee dollars contributed up to a maximum of 2,000 in the calendar year, which is the current amount, it will increase to $2,250 in a calendar year effective January 1st, 2024. And this is for the deferred compensation. Continuation of the funding for the minimum benefit amount for health plan years 2024 and 2025 for employees participating in the county health plan whose benefit amount may be less than, than the premium for the Anthem PPO 750 deductible employee only plan. So for employees enrolled in an SJVA health plan, employee plus family tier, the county shall contribute an additional $25 per pay period effective the 2020, 2024 health plan year and $25 for the 2025 health plan year. And lastly, approve a new administrative regulation number 50, establishing policies and procedures regarding a cell phone stipend for unrepresented fair, unrepresented fair labor FLSA exempt county employees to be effective July 1st, 2023. And a little bit more about that about administrative regulation 50. This um, this administ the proposed administrative regulation establishes a $55 per month cell phone stipend program for unrepresented county employees who are classified as, as exempt under the FLSA effective July 2nd, 2023. Participation in the proposed program would be voluntary and is subject to department head approval. Employees would have to enter into a, a maintenance and security agreement and comply with the restrictions of the agreement. Um, so the proposed monthly stipend of $55 would be prorated and paid to eligible employees over 26 pay periods um, starting in the first full pay period uh, once the agreement is fully signed. So that, that covers all of the requests. Um, are there any questions for me? Or I'm open to questions. <laughs> any questions for Lupe? Okay, I don't hear any. All right, um, so do we have any public comment on this matter? Do we have any emails or comment cards? We do not. Okay, hearing none, I will bring it back to the board for motion. Mr. Mr. Chair, I would move for approval of this item. Well, Amy pushed the button already, but regardless, <laughs> I think it's great that uh, we've been able to invest in our employees the way that uh, we have in this item and look forward to uh, completing negotiations and bringing forward, uh, hopefully, agreements with all of our units very soon. Okay, Supervisor yeah. Sheckley in. Yeah, I just wanted to comment also, you know, when I first came on the board, there was a lot of talk about uh, the health benefits and whatnot, and I think, you know, every year we're working on increasing those, especially for those with families. And also, I think the deferred compensation, um, it keeps going up, our matches keep going up, and I encourage folks to, to uh, participate in that plan also. So I, I am in full support of this. Supervisor Vanderbilt, so you can now push and, move. Uh, cry baby. <laughs> All right, cry baby. Okay, Whatever. we've got a couple more comments as well. So uh, Supervisor Valero. And I just wanna take this time out to acknowledge our um, HR department and the long hours and work that it takes to reach um, this. And so again, just thank you so much for um, being on the front lines to our county uh, employees for really, again, understanding the work that goes into this and the great um, work still to be, uh, to do ahead. And so again, just thank you for these efforts all across the board. Thank you, and we have uh, Vice Chair McCarry. Lupe, I want to commend you and your staff for, and negotiation staff for working on this and, and 
coming to being able to come to agreement. You know, I, I want staff to know that I was being a former county employee. We, we appreciate the staff. We do everything we can to help the staff and do what we can do to benefit them. But we also have to work on a business side too. But uh, I think we've come a long way from what we used to do. Uh, staff is actually appreciated now. When when I worked here, we weren't necessarily appreciated. And uh, we want to make certain that staff understands that and that we will continue what we can. We can't do everything. Uh, there's concerns being brought up at our meetings regarding short staffing. And, and the problem is, as individual departments are coming up talking about their short staff, it, it, the problem is it's not just that department. It, it's countywide. It's statewide. And it, and it has nothing to really do so much about wages. It could have a part of it. But uh, the workforce has changed dramatically, and that's something that we're trying, I know that we're trying to work on to see what we can do to bring that work, start, that work staff back. But um, there's, a, there's a lot of things to overcome, and, and I don't, the problem is I don't think even society knows what the issue is and why we're having such a staff shortage, because it's, it's just a, not you know, statewide, it's not a Tulare County issue. But to take from this, thank you. And I want staff to know that we absolutely appreciate them and we'll continue to do what we can to uh, support our staff. Thank you. And Supervisor Shuckling, you had another comment? Yes. <laughs> Did you? Um, it just went, it it just went away. <laughs> <laughs> well, while you're thinking about that, <clears throat> while you're thinking about it, I'll just, I'll, I'll just say, um, I've been on the board for, for five years and I've noticed uh, over that time there's just a, a lot of conversations about uh, what can we do for county employees um, and not, you know, in a, in a salary, how much can we compete on a salary level, how much can we compete on benefits, what can we uh, do to improve the, uh, the um, just the employee experience uh, overall. And so I think that just jogged uh, Supervisor Shuckling's memory. But uh, anyway, no, <laughs> but anyway, so uh, thank you for your hard work on this and all the others who have uh, put in a lot of time in, uh, in all the negotiations and, and bringing us to this point. Supervisor Shuckling. I remember. All right. So with Regulation 50, does that mean we have the opportunity to maybe just carry one phone? You can still carry your phone if you'd like, or you oh, can if, give your phone up and, and receive the stipend. Okay. <laughs> that was it. That was the one. Okay. <laughs> Supervisor Valero. Caveat on oh, the sorry. AR-50. Uh, as long as you're willing to follow the policies. Pa oh, pa <laughs> oh. That's a pretty big caveat. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, just yeah, better carry two. <laughs> Okay, Supervisor Valera. Yes, so I just wanted just one last comment um, that I know that we're always trying to achieve excellence across the board. And so excellence looks different for many different people, but as long as, again, teamwork makes the dream work and we can all have our arrows pointing in the right direction. Um, so again, thank you for all the work that went into this. Thank you. All right, very good. And we have already had actually um, a motion by uh, Supervisor Vanderpool, seconded by Supervisor Shucklin. So now we can cast our votes. And the item is approved five to zero. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you. And item number 36 is board matter request. Do any of the members have uh, an item they'd like to refer to staff for future agenda item? Supervisor Shucklian. And this one I remember. I would like to request that a while back we had uh, Noah give a presentation about the CSAC and the Cal League of Cities at home um, program proposal. Uh, there's a coalition building of, of agencies and counties and cities that are uh, adopting that um, as support. And I would like to have that brought to us. I know Fresno County last week um, adopted the resolution to support it, so I would like to have that uh, hopefully on our next agenda since we're in dark next week. Thank you. Any others? And I don't see any others, so that will take us to, uh, Madam Council, do we have the need for closed session today? Yes, Mr. Chair, there is need for closed session. Item A is off calendar. The balance of the agenda will be heard, and I do not anticipate any announcement out. Thank you. And since there's no announcement out, uh, we will conclude our uh, meeting today at the end of closed session. But thank you all for coming and uh, sitting through a, a, a full morning of, of things. So thank you.